Hi everybody, I'm Aaron Beach, I'm Executive Director here at Belvoir Street and uh, welcome to the Belvoir Street Theatre 2023 season launch. We are here in person launching a real season in a real theatre with real humans. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation um, on whose land the theatre here is built and pay my respect to Elders past and present. My main role today is to say thank you. And thank you is a really important phrase and a really important notion at the moment in the world that we're living in here at this theatre, here at all theatre companies, here in our lives, just to remember to sort of to say thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a list of incredible people to thank. But I'd like to start with each and every one of you who've come here tonight to be part of our launch and everyone who's at home and watching us um, on the live stream because without our community, we don't exist. As we've, we've faced over the last couple of years, there were times when this theatre sat dark with a ghost lamp and we, nobody was here, nobody gathered for many weeks and many months at a time. But this theatre company has a way to keep coming back and our community kept coming back and our artists kept coming back and our staff and our stakeholders. So a big thank you to each and everyone here, but I'm going to read this list in record time and then we're going to get on with the actual launch. <laughs> so the Belvoir community stretches far and wide and just like that incredible group of humans who came together in 1984 to purchase this theatre, we can only keep doing what we do every year because, because of an equally committed group of people in 2022. So I'd like to publicly pay tribute to some of them now. Our patron, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, our Governor of New South Wales. The Company B Board, in particular Sam Mears and our Deputy Chair, Paddy Copians. The Company A Board, led by Angela Pierman, who I notice is here tonight, and a number of the Company A Board members. I'd like to also acknowledge former Board members who remain long-term supporters of the Company. People like Andrew Cameron, Ian Learmonts, Stuart O'Brien and Anne Britton. Generous and committed donors who remain uh, the heartbeat of this organisation. I'd also like to pay tribute to the chair circle, the group and our beekeepers who again give um, generously to Belvoir each and every year. We have a number of trusts and foundations who support us. The Andrew Cameron Family Foundation, the Balnaves Foundation who support our First Nations work here at Belvoir, the Blake Beckett Trust, uh, Copyright Agency Limited, Doc Ross Family Foundation, Gandhi, Gandiva Foundation, the Greater X Foundation, the Macquarie Group Foundation, the Nelson Foundation, the Nelson Mears Foundation, Origin Sardines Foundation, Ian Potter Foundation, and the Wales Family Foundation. So if you happen to have a foundation and you'd like to support Belvoir, you, you too could have your name read out publicly. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge some partners. So our government partners, the Australia Council for the Art and Create New South Wales, our major partners, Baker McKenzie, EY, Walcott Research, Orbmanet, our media partners, Adflow, Alphabet and Anth Anthem, always start with an A, Aaron. <laughs> Associate partners, Barton Deacon, Kane Hughes, our youth and education partner, AFTT, audiovisual events, who incredible work with their AV support for us, particularly on Fangirls recently, if anyone saw that, it was all them. NCC, Houston Group, um, uh, Hotel Hacienda, um, ba Burke Street Bakery, Beckett's, Cooper's, some of these are some of my favourites now, um, Don Giovanni Pizza, Handpicked Wines, Merchant and Green, The Norfolk, Poor Tom's, another one of my favourites, and Zali. So again, you can see that it really does take a community to get this theatre company on stage each and every night. Um, before I finish, I'd like to also uh, importantly thank the Belvoir staff. These people work tirelessly each and every day, each and every year, to, uh, to launch our season to keep this theatre up and running each and every day. I was thinking today about uh, Tanya, who works in our box office. Tanya has been at Belvoir since 2007 and she's launching her 15th season at Belvoir in our box office. And it's the incredible... It's that, it's that incredible consistency of somebody who really believes in what we do each and every year. I don't, we shouldn't single people out, but it just struck me that to sit here at a season launch, it's one of the kind of most stressful times for customer service and box office. So I just wanted to sort of take that little moment to think 15 seasons, 15 season launches, 15 nights like tonight. So big thanks to everyone in, at the Belvoir staff. Now, let's welcome our artistic director, Eamon Flack, who will launch the 2023 season.
Uh, oh, I'm taller than Aaron. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I wasn't quite prepared for this. Um, welcome to the 2022, no, 23 <laughs> season launch. Uh, I have jet lag. Um, I, I have to do some thank yous. Look, I, look, I know we want to get to this, but um, that's the book. This is the season in here. But uh, there are, I, I want to thank everyone. This is specifically a, a quick few thank yous about th this book, about the launch and about the shows that we've put together. So it's, it's, this is specifically about the season itself. Uh, Tim and Paul and the staff at Alphabet, Dan Bood for the season photography, uh, Claudia Rochella who uh, shot a particular photo in there. I want to thank all of the artists who came to the photo shoot. Uh, Tilly the dog and Tilly's owner Claire uh, for a particular show. Uh, to the creatives who made that photo shoot happen, uh, styling by Ella Butler and Keithy Subramaniam, hair and makeup by Emily Court and Yolanda Lukowski, uh, to uh, the production crew who made um, all the bits and pieces in the production, as well as the production crew who have set up everything here tonight for us to be able to launch. Uh, I especially want to thank Ashling and her team in marketing and Ollie and their team uh, in customer service. Um, th that uh, they're, the, they're the key thank yous, but there's also a very uh, particular group, so we are honing in here. Don't worry, there's dramaturgy at work, I promise. Uh, I want to thank the artistic and programming team who uh, we work together to put this season on. Uh, being an artistic director is at times an incredibly lonely thing, uh, but it's never truly lonely because um, this company has worked very hard over the last few years to make sure that we have a, a, a group of people who are um, creating as many possible doorways into this company and our work as possible so that this company is as open as it can possibly be. Um, uh, and um, so I, I just, you know, it's worth acknowledging that this is um, a group effort. So in, in no particular order, uh, although the first name here is someone who's not here tonight, but I do want to thank um, Aaron's immediate um, predecessor, Sue Donnelly. Sue's still in the United Kingdom. Uh, Sue has been the executive director for, I, I, can't, like a, I, I don't like its dog years when you look at this company, but it's somewhere between four years and about 80 years, actually. I, I couldn't quite tell you if I'm really honest. Um, but we're saying farewell to Sue when she gets back from, uh, we've just been on tour with, with Canning Cracking. When Sue gets back, there'll be a full farewell. But I do want to just pay a tribute to Sue. She's been an extraordinary uh, personal support, but also an incredible champion for this company. Uh, um, Cody Bedford, who is an associate artist and a dramaturg and a former Balnaves fellow here. Emily David, uh, who is our uh, artistic administrator. Hannah Goodwin is a resident artist. Carissa, Lich Carissa Lichardello is a resident artist here. Abby Lee Lewis is a resident artist and the Andrew Cameron fellow here at the moment, also recently returned from the tour of Canny and Cracking. Uh, Dom Mercer. Dom, you've had so many titles, but I think you're just sort of like um, uh, the king of everything is probably the best title for Dom Mercer. Um, uh, Zainab Syed, also still on tour at the moment with Canning Cracking. Uh, Tom Wright and Thomas Weatherall, uh, who, uh, who is also uh, the Balnaves Fellow here this year. So that's the group of people, the large group of people who put this season together. Uh, okay, that's the thank yous. Um, it's fortuitous that you were last, Thomas. Uh, Thomas and I are both from Queensland. Uh, actually, that's a thread tonight. Uh, Thomas was... Were you living in Brisbane when you wrote this? I'm going to invite Thomas up. This is Thomas Weatherall, everybody. Uh, Thomas, you are a writer and an actor, and you have written a play called Blue... Is that what happens now? <laughs> does, does the screen change now? Oh, great. Thomas Weatherill's Blue is our first show next year. <laughs> we'll figure it out as we go. Yeah. Do you want to tell us about your play? Yeah, sure. I, I don't mean to be rude, but I did make some notes because I, I, always, I find it kind of tricky talking about Blue because... I don't want to give away the plot because it does unravel kind of as you watch it, but also it's a really personal and kind of very private project that I never quite intended to reach this kind of scale. Um, I didn't really think it was going to make it out of my bedroom, so, you know, but Blue tells the story of Mark and he's a young man who is struggling with the process of growing up and moving forward and 
we meet him at this point in his life where he's kind of forced to examine some personal and familial grief and kind of look into those really ugly and tough parts of his life and, you know, the kind of things that he's been pushing aside up until this moment and really try and make sense of them. Um, the blue and the use of the ocean is kind of a constant backdrop to the play and it's something that I've always kind of used as a connection to or more so um, representation of both Mark and my own life and, you know, kind of this beautiful chaos that is the ocean and, you know, this journey and tumultuous nature of life that both I feel myself and Mark have been going through these past few months. But um, the play deals with some really heavy stuff. It's quite a hard one to get through. It's um, love and life and grief and death, mental health and really kind of the question of, you know, how do we find the strength to continue on when all the odds kind of seem completely stacked against you? Um, Thomas has been the Balnaves Fellow, so we, we read this play, um, I you know, like, I've, again, time, what's time? Um, uh, but, but we're, uh, like, instantly struck by, look, you can see there's an age difference between us, standing side by side, but I wish I had the wisdom and self-possession that Thomas has. This is a, a play of extraordinary depth. It's an exquisite monologue um, uh, that is performed with several other performers. Um, uh, You've been the the, uh, the Balnaves Fellow, and yet um, Thomas has also been incredibly busy starring in, I mean, pretty much every new Australian television show that's been shooting in the last six months. So he's been coming and going quite a lot. He's also in it, as well as having written it. Um, I'm very pleased to announce that it's being directed by one of the great alumni of Bangara Dance, Deborah Brown, making her directing debut here. Um, uh, and a really, really fabulous uh, team of creatives, uh, including um, Jacob Nash, Chloe Ogilvie, Will Hughes, um, uh, all, um, all fantastic Indigenous creatives. Um, uh, the last thing I need to say about it is um, uh, it's exquisitely beautiful. Uh, it's, it's part of uh, collab uh, ongoing collaborations with Sydney Festival. Thomas, please take a seat. <laughs> Just while you're sitting up there, just reflect on that's what it's going to be like to be alone up here performing your show. <laughs> uh, Maeve, I do remember that before tonight, we had a conversation about what I was going to say and what you were going to say. I've already forgotten it all. Um, uh, but That's right, yes. Uh, Maeve Marsden is a lesbian. <laughs> Well, no, there's one more thing I do have to say. Uh, Maeve Marston joined a writing program that we began... Um, uh, like, this company is working incredibly hard to make sure that... Look, I'll be really honest with you. Um, the, the, the arts policy settings in this country are abysmal and there's, a, there's enormous gaps and there's great failures. And the responsibility to make sure that artists are able to develop is increasingly falling on the, on the last surviving standing companies. This company works to take that responsibility incredibly seriously. So we have been running as many programs as we can to support artists as they develop and grow. Maeve, as one of these programs, pitched the idea of writing a lesbian divorce comedy. Maeve Marston. <laughs> I did. Um, I also made notes because the brief was to be brief and anyone who's met me knows that's not my natural inclination. Um, so thank you and thanks Eamon and um, the whole Belvoir team, in particular Dom, who I've worked with a lot on this play. Um, Blessed Union, my play, is a play about a family falling apart as it tries to stay together. It's a play about the end of love when who you love is politicised. Um, and it's about food, um, a lot of food. So my apologies in advance to stage management. <laughs> As a writer, I'm interested in the nuclear family and I'm interested in how it functions or perhaps doesn't under late stage capitalism. It seems wild to me that we try this crazy work of raising children within a romantic uh, partnership all the while preoccupied with employment and housing and housework and social standing and community accountability and God knows what else. Um, it's wild and it's impossible and yet we do it with ambition and love again and again. 
Um, it's these contradictions of love and logic and responsibility and desire that are central to this play, um, aided in no small part by me trying to conceive my first child as I started to write it. I'm finishing it, a parent to a one-year-old, up to the eyeballs in all the love and contradictions I'd imagined. Um, I just wanted to say that I grew up coming to this theatre and so having my first play happen on this stage is an incredible moment for me. Uh, <laughs> I grew up um, getting dropped off here by my own lesbian mothers who I think were hoping I would choose a different career path. <laughs> but alas, I did not. Um, so for this play to be about my family and my, well, about queer families and about my community and for it to be a celebration, but also a loving critique means more than you could know, unless you too come from communities that were never rendered as anything but a two-dimensional stereotype on screen and on stage if they were rendered at all. I'm stoked to be working with Hannah Goodwin, who's a warm and insightful director, whose feedback throughout this has been so amazing throughout the writing process, and that Maud Davy and Daniel Cormack are playing the mothers is beyond anything I could have ever dreamed. It's absolutely, they're iconic, I'm beside myself. Um, I hope audiences find something of themselves in this play, whether you're queer or not, and I really hope you laugh. Um, it's taken me a long time what a to realise what a privilege it is to laugh at the worst of ourselves. Uh, when you grow up in a queer family and you're on the political back foot, you're always afraid of giving cannon fodder to the other side. Um, so having the space to be messy and flawed in public and on stage feels like freedom. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maeve. Um, uh, it's, it's a beautiful... It's, uh, there's a great line in Taylor Mack's play here, which was on this stage, which is, you, are you young people, you've never learned not to fuck with form and content at the same time. But M Maeve has, Maeve has uh, in order to kind of put the focus squarely on, on the, um, the content, has written a really beautiful, classically shaped family drama. Um, it's fantastic. I'm very excited about it. Um, we're going to skip the next one. We'll come back to it for less exciting reasons than you think. Um, Nathan, uh, you, you know Nathan, and you know, actually many of you will know this play. Nathan Maynard, who was the um, Andrew Cameron, f uh, the Balnaves Fellow, well, during COVID, actually. Um, come on up, Nathan. Nathan's just come from, from Lutruwita, from, uh, from Palawa Country in Tasmania. Um, we are bringing back Nathan's play, uh, At What Cost, which um, set this stage alight uh, um, at the beginning of this year. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your play, Nathan? Um, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> G'day, everyone. How are we? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I suppose I'll start with what it's about. I, I suppose when I, when I think about At What Cost, it's, it's about your responsibility to community, but also... Who has the right to say who is Aboriginal and who, who isn't? Yeah, yeah it's a bit juicy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, can, you tell us, can you tell us just sort of literally what the plot setup is? Yeah, I can, but I've just got to get my phone. Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked and everyone says, what's your play about? And I could, I could never do it off the top of my head. Um, so Boyd Mansell is on edge. He's looking, looking after a parcel of Aboriginal land that's been taken away from his community by the government and handed on to a new Aboriginal organisation in the state. Like I said, juicy. <laughs> Problem is, their members aren't recognised as Aboriginal by the Palawa community. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> on top of this, the skull of ancestor William Lanny is coming home from England to Tasmania and Boyd has a responsibility of the skull's cremation, which on a cultural level is sending Lanny's spirit back to the ancestors. Then, knock, knock, a stranger arrives. <laughs> um, we, we, I know this is not what we planned, but I, want to, I do want to talk about this um, re really, really briefly. So, so you wrote the play down on Palawa Country. Yep. Um, after the play was on here, it like it, it um, it's a rare thing. This play, it's a real, it's a true Australian tragedy. Uh, you know, like Nathan's a very funny man. It's a funny play, but what he's writing is really a tragedy. Um, and and when it performed here, it it just 
like it cut through in a way that, that, you know, like is rare and special. And there was immediately a great deal of interest all over the country for this play to visit many, many other theatres. Um, but, but actually, the best thing of all about this play getting up a national tour and having a, re a return season is that it will go back to country. Yep. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah, I, it means, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it means the, the world to myself, but also to our community. Um, you know... I'll, you know, to see this work at home and for the communities to, to see themselves on stage, you know, it, it is a form of validation. And it, and because we've been screaming about this issue for such a long time and to for, for our mob to say everyone sees this is a problem and we can talk about this issue now. Yeah. Um, thank you for letting us do play again. Yeah. For, for yeah. <laughs> thanks for doing my play again. <laughs> Um, uh, and, you know, hopefully in future we'll be able to talk about other plays you've been writing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah please. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nathan Maynard, everybody. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, I'm just going to make sure I'm not skipping anything. I'm pretty sure I'm not. So, um, David Finnegan is an expert but in, in climate change, in the science of climate change, in the economics and the, the politics of climate change. Uh, his father was a climate scientist. He grew up um, uh, learning about these things. He knows what he's talking about. But David's also a, a terrific playwright. Um, uh, I just, in Edinburgh, managed to catch his solo work, which was called You're Safe Until 2024, which is in a few years' time. Um, uh, he, he knows how to use the pure drama of information, um, of scientific information, economic information, brilliantly. Uh, he sent us a play um, that we... Uh, look, I'll be honest, originally it wasn't in our season. When we first drafted a season and was, was like, that's what we're going to do next year. And then in the, the period of time that followed, we all sort of just, just sort of kept thinking about this play that wasn't in the season and we did everything we could to put it back into the season. Um, uh, it's called Scenes from the Climate Era. Um, uh, it is exactly what it says on the box. And I want to introduce the director of it, Carissa Licciadello. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit? Do you want to kind of just give a very simple description of what it is? Yeah. Yep. a story about the climate era and what it is to live through it and what it might be to live through it. And he realised very quickly that you can't do that through a single story. So instead he's told many, many stories in one. So the play is a series of scenes or snapshots from life across the climate era. So that's way back to the middle of the 20th century um, through now, through to many speculative possible futures. And that means that the scope of the work and the ambition of the work is massive. And it takes you, it might, you know, it involves things like a um, conversation between a group of scientists a couple of years from now and they're trying to work out how they're going to build a kind of artificial man-made reef so that they can feed humanity. And then a few more years down the track, it's a group of mates sitting at, sitting at a pub and talking about the last plane flight they ever took. And then way, 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 way in the distant future, there's a man teaching his son how to shave, and that's it. So there's the whole scope of um, humanity and human experience in it. And I think what's extraordinary about it is that I'm sure when climate crisis comes up, a lot of us just want to kind of get into bed and put the covers over our heads because it's way too much to deal with. And I think David kind of looks at that squarely in the eye and he takes us into the... Um, fear and the terror of what might come and might unfold and all of those awful things that we think about. But he also takes us into this, all these other possibilities. His imagination kind of opens us up into many different ways that the world might look, which is kind of galvanising and compelling and exciting and thrilling and keeps you in it. And he also um, looks at all of the things that will remain, no matter what changes, the kind of human connection and love and joy. And so it's quite a incredible special work which we're really excited to be doing extremely excited it's it's really interesting this question of um uh like there's this thing that 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 gets said inside a lot of circles around the art which is that there's no such thing anymore as art that isn't about climate change this is the reality of the world we live in everything has to be about it and yet for theater like 
um, that the hit theatre is kind of basically humanist and for hundreds of years it's really just been about people inside rooms and yet the, the, the experience of climate change has got little to do with the human frame. And so how you make theatre about climate change is a really profound problem for our art form. It's a basic dramaturgical problem because so much of it happens off stage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so David's solution to this is to present many, many scenes across a great amount of time. There's dozens of them. The proliferation of, of the sort of like um, turning of a diamond really, that this play presents, get, ends up giving you something that starts sounding earnest, but you, you, every now and then, so, you know like when you're, you, know, you don't realise how much you want to drink a water until someone gives it to you? That's how I felt reading this play. You suddenly go, oh God, I didn't know how much I needed someone who knows what they're talking about to tell us what the hell we're about to go through and what we've been living through. And it's incredible service that he does. I find it a very beautiful, very human play mm. at the same time as giving us this kind of like highly dramatic account of, um, of what the climate era means. Mm. Yep. Mm. Anything excellent. else? Oh, we've got an excellent um, cast. There's going to be an ensemble cast of five, but you can see three of them plus a frog popping up on the screen behind us. The frogs are TBC. We're just seeing about the you know, practicality <laughs> of that. They say don't work with animals, but we're thinking about it. Um, but we do have also um, Brandon McClelland, Abby Lee Lewis and Charles Wu in the cast, and that's a pretty exciting place to start. Thank you. Um, oh, okay, so, um, I'm trying to remember, we did talk about it, I'm remembering, okay, uh, there is a young woman called Lily, Am I got, have I got this right so far, is that what I'm doing, yep, there's a young woman called Lily, uh, she, uh, she's a Chinese Australian woman, uh, her grandmother has just died, have I got it right so far? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, and um, it, yes, I know what it's about. I'm just struggling to articulate it. Actually, what I want to say is that Michelle Law writes the has the best plot premises of anyone that I like. You're brilliant at plot premises. I think I guess you watched a lot of videos growing up in on the Sunshine Coast. She writes genre plot premises exquisitely well. It's about a grandmother who comes back to haunt her grandma, a granddaughter, and force her to discover wisdom and change. Let's put it that way. Michelle Law. <laughs> uh, this is a show that we have announced twice before. We got as far as teching it and dressing it on this stage, but we are finally going to do it. And if that means that we have to push back the pandemic, that's what we will do. God. Michelle. Third time lucky. I mean, it survived two COVID lockdowns. So um, that's only, uh, you know, we're only up and um, away with it. Uh, I will say now that Eamon's really uh, lovingly talked about the story, um, I will talk about everything that surrounds it. Um, so I, th I feel like some of you may have seen Single Asian Female, which was on at uh, Belvoir several years ago. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, and I, I was really taken aback and genuinely surprised by the goodwill and, and the love and support that I received from audiences for it because I really thought that, oh, you know, I'll just write one play and then that's it. That's cool. Uh, and then, um, you know, at the time I, I was really quite awed by the amount of audiences who came who had never seen a theatre show before, especially people from Asian Australian communities. And I'd, I'd brought my grandmother uh, along to see it who has since sadly passed and I remember her watching it and enjoying it but sort of saying to me afterwards, oh, you know, it was really lovely to see people reacting to it but I don't know what it was about because I didn't understand it. It wasn't in Cantonese. <laughs> uh, so something that was really important for me uh, in terms of making it accessible to all different types of communities was making Miss Peony, my second play, uh, trilingual. So it's, it's something that I haven't seen on Australian stages to date, I don't think, um, seeing a play that is simultaneously told uh, through subtitles in English, Cantonese or traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese, which is Mandarin. So all audiences who are able to speak all of those language, languages will be able to come to see the show and actually understand and feel included in it, uh, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, we have the same incredible team of cast members and crew as the previous two years. Uh, <laughs> uh, they've managed to stick around and, and stay loyal to the project, so God bless them. Uh, and um, I'm really excited to, to tell this story about Chineseness and womanhood and how those identities intersect, um, and as well as exploring sort of uh, the complex issues of lateral violence that can happen in, in amongst Chinese communities. Um, so it's a story of belonging. Uh, there's going to be a lot of laughs, um, a lot of tears, and, and if you did come to Single Asian Female you en and you enjoyed that, I think this is going to be, you know, even bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and and pr I think it's probably the most glamorous, glitziest looking show that I think I've ever seen on this stage, actually. <laughs> yeah, I think um, Jonathan's uh, asset design, set and costume designer's uh, inspiration was actually RuPaul. Uh, <laughs> uh, so brace yourself for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Law. Uh, on the on the first day uh, of working from home, uh, um, uh, my first kind of like oh, telephone. This was before Zoom telephone meeting. Uh, we'd arranged to to meet with um, with one of the country's finest playwrights, Sue Smith, who is here tonight. Um, who had um, like you know this meeting was ready to happen in person, and then we had to have it on the telephone. And Sue had um, said to us that she wanted to turn a, a, a novel by one of Australia's finest novelists, Charlotte Wood, who is also here, into a play. And uh, and the description that Sue gave of why this um, exquisite novel wanted to be a play was really beguiling, and I c I can still remember sort of like the um, th this sort of like s sort of something that was just like. Uh, a notion on a page at a kind of grim time, kind of flourishing in my imagination. And I, I feel like I've held on to it ever since then um, and have been wishing for it ever since then. So I, I, I want to introduce um, neither of you two. <laughs> because writers just write. <laughs> And I want to introduce you to the great Belinda Giblin, who I shall just say is wearing glasses for a reason. Yes, she's not just being um, <laughs> highfalutin. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Belinda Giblin, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Belin Belin Belinda, the glasses, like the character in the play, what's the common theme between...? Ageism, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I can't see anybody, of course. I had a cataract operation two days ago, so uh, I look like something from the land of the living dead. I look like a zombie, actually, so I don't want to frighten you. I cannot tell you how excited, uh, how excited I am to actually see the writer here, uh, whom I never expected to see, um, and Charlotte. I, I had actually read the book two days later, I was asked to do the play. And I thought, this was meant to be, this was meant to be. <laughs> That's like something that might happen in the story, actually. Absolutely. Um, it's so, it, yeah. I don't know, if those of you who, have you who have read it will know the story, but it's the story of three old friends, there used to be four old friends, uh, who gather to um, pack up uh, the house of, of their recently deceased friend, um, uh, in order to sort of find some way to, uh, you know, just practically rearrange things. But, of course, death and, and, and the passing of time, especially for uh, women, is not a simple practical matter. Is that a description of what's yes, going on? Yes, I think um, in their grief they have to uh, reevaluate and possibly renegotiate their friendships and also reevaluate themselves... Uh, they've known each other for something like 30 plus years. They're all in their early 70s, as I am, very early 70s. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so they're also forced to face the prospect of ageing, of um, uh, invisibility, of um, irrelevance to some extent, uh, of missed opportunity of their ailments but mainly their friendships uh, and how to adjust uh, to their 
friendships as they are now and I think friendships are ever changing. The interesting thing and the reason I'm loving doing this play uh, is that I was at Sydney University way back in 400 years ago. No, it was 1968. It was during the Vietnam War, during the moratorium marches. Uh, I remember walking down George Street with a beret and thigh-high boots and a mini skirt, the perfect activist, uh, uh, and really thinking I was something else. But the friends I made uh, at university are still my very dearest, closest friends, uh, all four of them. So, so much of this play is identifiable for me. And I would suggest uh, for a very large percentage of the theatre-going demographic. I mean, who's had a bloody cataract operation? Hands <laughs> up, come on. Surely, surely, yes. One of the things... One of the so things much that... to identify with. One of the things that Charlotte, that you said when we when we first met about this was, and I asked why you wrote it, and you said that you'd just been watching your mother's friends, mother-in-law's friends, uh, together, and that you were you thought it was kind of funny and really interesting how awful and terrible and rude they were to each other, <laughs> and that 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 the total honesty of it was part of the seed of it. Did I just give yeah. something away? What I'm trying to say is that there, that there's great joy inside this as well. This stage is really, really. This, amongst the many things this particular stage is good at, is taking what is utterly familiar, um, very local, very known to us all, and uh, finding the high drama inside and the ordinary and and the familiar, and uh, redeeming that or honouring that. Yeah. And Sue's script has, um, has has done that of Charlotte's novel. It's going to be directed by Sarah Goods, who I think is one of the finest, um, most precise directors in this country. Yeah. Um, uh, and then when you add to that um, Belinda, as well as Tony Scanlon, as well as Melita Urisic, then there is an extraordinary group of women taking control and of the And a dog. Stage. And <laughs> a dog, yes. Magic realism. We'll yeah. see how that <laughs> plays out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's so exciting yep. and it's going to be so... It's so full of humour and resilience and um, joy and, and dare I say, um, mutiny even. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? So you the, wrote the damn thing. What am I telling you this? The Weekend by Charlotte Wood, uh, 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 written as a play by Sue Smith uh, with Belinda Giblin. Playing the actress. <laughs> Thank you. Um... The next one I'm going to uh, just... How am I going to do this? Um, so, this... I'll just keep it really simple. Um, Zara Newman, astonishing. Um, like, it's... That anyone can act that well and sing that well is um, an insult to other actors and singers. Um, she's extraordinary. Like, like an astonishing, um, uh, like, performer. Um... Uh, playing Billie Holiday, the great Billie Holiday. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a piece that Zara's been wanting to do for many, many, many years. Um, uh, and in a second on this video, we'll meet Mitchell Butel, who is a great mate of Zara's, and they've been talking together for a long time about this. Mitchell's been waging a great campaign to be able to get the rights to this particular show. It's uh, essentially a solo performance. Um, uh, it's a concert, um, uh, but it's a play. It's, it's a cabaret and it's a play. Zara plays Billie Holiday and she, she tells, uh, Billie Holiday tells her own life story. Uh, Billie Holiday's story is an extraordinary one. Uh, not only was she one of the great artists, but she was one of the great activist voices uh, at a very crucial time in the history of the United States and in the history of uh, a lot of, uh, of movements internationally. Um, uh, so let's just meet Mitchell Butel on... Uh, Mitchell's in Adelaide, but he recorded this for us earlier on. Hi, everybody. Mitchell Butel here. Sorry I can't be there with you to celebrate the launch of this fantastic season that Bellboy has put together. Uh, I'm in Adelaide uh, rehearsing for The Normal Heart, hence this um, very bushy 1980s moustache that's going on at the moment. But I just wanted to say how incredibly excited I am to be directing this wonderful piece with the brilliant Zara Newman as the late, great Billie Holiday. I've long been a fan of Billie Holiday's amazing musicianship and artistry and integrity as a performer. And they are all things that Zara has in spades as well. I first worked with Zara on uh, The Government Inspector, that uh, very naughty production for Belvoir and Malthouse, and I've been in love with her on stage and off ever since. 
I know this will be a real treat for audiences, um, both the incredible music, but the incredible way this, uh, this story about Billie Holiday is put together. And I know Zara will knock it out of the park as she always does. I know you're gonna have a great time at Lady Day with the wonderful Zara Newman. Have a great night, bye. Uh, Zara's performing tonight, which is why she can't be with us. Um, uh, Lady Day is a co-production with Melbourne Theatre Company and with State Theatre Company of South Australia. Uh, I'm just watching to see if someone has arrived. Do we know? Oh, but, no, but, but not yet. <laughs> uh, I've got, no, we've actually got two more. Sorry, I just was, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, thanks. Justin, everybody, Justin Smith. Um, uh, well, I'm going to, look, for the next, the next show, I'm just going to do what everyone should do um, uh, um, uh, at the feet of Robin Archer, which is step out of the way and let her speak for herself. Robin Archer. Hi, everyone. It's Robin Archer. You know, when I did my first significant show in Sydney, it was 45 years ago, and it was in this building downstairs, Cold Comfort Cafe. Then I became part of the mob that chipped in to buy the building, and then lots of shows after that, but not for a long time. So it's great to be back at Belvoir. This time, it's Robin Archer, an Australian songbook, and it's not exactly what you think. I doubt that you'll know many of the songs. It's a different perspective on Australian song and sort of tells a different story. I pay tribute to our great First Nations songwriters, but then from 1829, a song from Reverend John McGarvey, all the way to Kate Miller Heidke and a few of my own. It goes from politics to seriousness, it's moving. There are heaps of belly laughs. For instance, when I recite a poem taught to be by my mother, um, probably I was a little too young to receive such a poem, but it's a huge mix. Musically, it's fantastic. Don't worry about my guitar and ukulele. The boys are absolutely sublime. George Petrumlis on accordion, he played with the Black Sorrows and Zydeco Jump. Cameron Goodall, you might know him from Sydney Theatre. He's an actor, but he's a great guitarist. And he also started the band, The Audreys. And Ennio Posobon, who played the lead, Gareth Evans, in Keating the Musical, a brilliant pianist. They all sing, they give me great harmonies. So we'll go from the ridiculous, uh, an insect on the windscreen of my heart, one of my own compositions, all the way to the sublime with Rob Davidson's fantastic setting of Julia Gillard's misogyny speech. You never know with a new show whether it's gonna work or not, but in Brisbane, we played to around 2000 subscribers and at the end of each show, they were on their feet cheering. I really hope that we can do the same for you here and I'm so happy to be back at Belvoir Street again. Uh, yeah, a, a true legend of Australian theatre and um, a great, great pleasure to welcome her back to Belvoir Street. Um, Beck Massey is not the next show, but she's in the next show. Um, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, in, in the first lockdown, uh, amongst the many things that this company did to try and um, just keep artists in work, we uh, set up a, we, we brought a whole lot of actors in on, uh, actors and other artists in on contract for three months and a day a week we would just read uh, plays, we, uh, old plays, classics, and talk about how we might bring them back to life. We called it the Adaptation Group. And on a whim... I gave the group a copy of this novel by Mikhail Bulgakov, The Master and Margarita. Um, uh, and in... So, I'll say that much. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and? And. Right, OK. So, it wasn't quite true what Aaron said, that there was no one in this building, because we came into this building... We were like allowed... Rats. We were allowed to. We were allowed in... And uh, we came into this building and, and worked on plays that we thought we would never be able to stage, not because the theatre wouldn't open again, but because they were difficult plays, they were stretching plays, and they were sort of different plays from the plays that, that we had been seeing on stage for a while. Um, and we read this book and we were set homeworks from this book. And... Um, uh, but in in the search 
this is a, like that group was dedicated to this problem that theatre has, which is that the past gets further and further away, faster and faster, and a whole lot of plays that used to be kind of like really solid, grounded staples of our theatre culture feel like they like just sort of belong to um, another time, and that that's been happening faster and faster. And so the, the more we looked for classics, the fewer we found. But when we read this novel, it mm. leapt into the present in a way um, that none of us, I think, quite expected actually. Well, Liz, you, you talked a lot about the idea of infection because we were there with this, you know, incredible pandemic that, that none of us had experienced ever. And in, in this book, it's the story of the devil arriving in Moscow. And it's set in the 20s in Russia, um, so just after the revolution in this brave new world of, um, you know, where they were going to change, change the way everybody lived and it was, it was going to be amazing. And the devil arrives, he's sort of invited in a weird way to, to this town um, that's strangely like Surrey Hills, it's Sydney. Um, and where, where, you know, they, the, they're reporting back to the devil, you know, how, he says, how's it going down there? You know, they've, 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 they've had a revolution and what's happening? And, and the guy goes, well, you know, it's sort of the same. It's... Uh, I, it, it, it's real estate, really. It's, it's ruining people. <laughs> so there's many things in this book that, that we can sort of hold on to, the kind of like our small lives. What I love about it, um, and I love how everyone had a phone and I, like an ancient, brought a book. But what, what, what I love about it is how the question it asks is, who is responsible? If, is there a God? and it uses the word God, is there a God? And if there's not, then, then who's responsible? You know, playing into the David Finnegan question of, oh, gee, what's the plan, guys? So the, it's, it, it, the story is really quite simple. The devil turns up to Moscow and wreaks complete havoc, but the form of havoc that the devil's... Uh, the form that that, 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 that that havoc takes is high theatricality breaking out in the streets of a frightened city um, and of a city that's lost its imagination and it's lost its sense of, of joy um, and that's gotten a little bit too serious and a little bit too preoccupied with... Um, uh, saying estate. the right things and thinking the right things and real estate and going to the right restaurants and, uh, you know, Surrey Hills or Moscow, who can tell? Um, uh, but but uh, this book actually was, I think it's a kind of... Um, it, it was written in incredible adversity. It was written in secret. It shouldn't exist today. We shouldn't be able to hold that book in Surrey Hills today. Uh, the writer should have been shot in the back of the head for writing it. Many of his colleagues were. But he wrote it in secret, and that book outwitted uh, that repressive Stalinist regime. And it's become a great emblem for, for um, artistic in, uh, imagination in the decades since then around the world. It's, it's a kind of curse or a hex, this book, on all forms of authoritarianism, or of all forms of autocracy, on all forms of anyone who wants to kind of like um, uh, use the power of the state or the power of any sort of, of, of hierarchy to grab the imaginations and minds of any people and squeeze them into submission. And this book refuses to accept that. And when we started to read that book out loud, it was like a spell had been cast and something had come back to life. We couldn't resist doing it. Um, so all that happens at the beginning of our show is Beck Massey walks out with the book and begins to read. But what happens by the end of it, it uh, requires um, all sorts of astonishing, unstage <laughs> unstageable things to happen because Bulgakov wrote this incredible flight of imaginative freedom that mm. does include, for example, a woman flying naked over the streets of Moscow, which we will do with no set. That's the promise to you. Um, so come to see our great... <laughs> Uh, it, for us, it's, it's kind of like saying, what can this company do that no other company can do? What can you do with nothing <laughs> but some actors in a book? What can you do with a group of people? It's a large cast. What can you do with pure imagination and an invitation to the audience to join in? Um, it's, a, it's a mad adventure. Uh, it's a great labour of love for all of us. Uh, mm. It's called The Master Margarita. And mm. um, Beck Massey is going to be one of uh, uh, t 10 to 12 performers inside that show. The Master Margarita. <laughs> So now we're going... That, actually, the Master Margaret is the last show of the year. But remember we skipped one for what I said was a not at all interesting reason. It was not an interesting reason. It's just that we knew Justin was late. 
That was it. Uh, uh, Justin is a singer-actor of um, incredible skill. Do you want to just hop up? Sure. Um, this is... Uh, oh, sorry, by the way, um, uh, uh, I'm directing that one. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm also directing this one. This one is actually much earlier in the year, but we're doing it last because Justin was late. Um, Sorry. Uh, oh, no, I was going to say it. It's Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I was thinking a lot. I'll just do my, my bit do and it. we can chat. Um, I was thinking a lot about what to offer audiences. Um, sorry, I feel like I've really been giving you guys the, the shoulder. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about, sorry, you guys, about what to offer audiences after the last little, um, it's, you know, it's been a wretched couple of years in many ways uh, for a whole lot of reasons. And it, f it feels like there's a lot we have to talk about and we've a lot we've got to get our heads around. But we also have to make sure we keep creating space inside our minds to receive ideas and uh, to take on board everything. And uh, sometimes that means that you just need that you need to kind of like step away from reality and enter into um, you know like the the kind of um, other worlds of the imagination, the the sort of spaces of fairy tale and mythology that I think just their function is to create the honeycomb that's just the, the but not the honey or something. I don't know that we we need to open up some room in order to find our way forward because if it's if it's sort of relentlessly serious, which life is at the moment then we actually can't cope. We need to kind of break that open in a way. And when I was a, when I was a very... Um, look, I was, when I was a young man... I, look, I was living in Brisbane, let's just say that much. It was rough. Uh, I was lost. But I discovered this piece, and it does something to your imagination, and it kind of says to you that it is possible to see your way... Um, to kind of imagine your way out of things, and, you know, just to be glib about it. It's felt like everyone's been in the woods in the last couple of years. It's a magnificent piece that uses kind of, like, extraordinary wit... Some of the most brilliant um, lyric, well, you know, probably the most brilliant lyric writing in the last few hundred years. Um, incredible plotting. Uh, it starts as a comedy, but as it develops, it sort of becomes more interested in, um, in sort of wisdom and loss, um, but in a way that, that always remains buoyant and full of love and full of hope. It's a really extraordinary piece of incredible inventiveness. Um, uh, and I asked, I've, like, we're, we're putting it together late, but... I yeah. asked Justin if he would be in it um, to play the baker. Oh. Uh, and you didn't see me do this, but I went like, I went like that. Oh. Thank <laughs> Like, yeah. it's such a gift. Like, the show's a gift, that, that role's a gift. I've always wanted to do it. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> like, other than, you know, aside from it being an amazing piece, I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> uh, what else should I say? Uh, do, maybe you could tell everyone just a really sort of like direct what like what is it what, what um, happens? Okay, so it's 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 the it's fairy tale. Act one is about what you wish for, and act two is what happens when you get it, after you get it, <laughs> how you deal with it, how it changes you, how it breaks you, how you have to fix yourself again. So it's it's about so many things. Yeah, he's so. I'm sure you all know. His work, but um, this show particularly, the way that he um, sets up a motif and it builds and it seeps into your brain, into your heart, and teaches you as the show goes on. So you get this great, joyful sort of act one, and everyone's you know getting all the things they wish for, and then using the same motifs that he's kind of sort of injected into you, just flips it. And you've kind of learnt the language by that stage, but it's kind of turned on you. And as as the characters go through these changes, you really experience it as Beautiful. well. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it features all of the, you know, like all those fairy tale characters we all know so well. But it's a kind of great mashup of them. In my mind, it's having done Angels in America and Glass Menagerie. I really do see this as the third of kind of three great. Um, masterpieces by gay American dramatists from the last 50 years alongside those plays. A little bit like Angels in America, it's a play which probably you kind of like go, how the hell are they going to do that at Belvoir Street? It shouldn't fit. But that actually that's part, of the, that's, that's part of the magic of it, that finding ways for this stage to meet that play and to find solutions to those things is that, that what that does is force acts of imagination into the process and in the, in the kind of like um, into the room that I think is what makes um, this, you know, it's what this 
theatre is about. Uh, it, it also, look, we're, we're, there's a lot of cast still to announce, but we can say that Tamsin Carroll will be in it, who is an extraordinary performer, um, uh, and um, how wonderful to be continuing um, the Carroll family <laughs> Uh, legacy, Tamsin is Peter Carroll's daughter, um, and the incredible Esther Hannaford, who was last here in Mr. Burns, will also be in Amazing. it. Um, it's the first time I think this company's ever done a Stephen Sondheim musical. When Sondheim died last year, the great Australian critic Peter Cravens called him the Shakespeare of music theatre, and I think that there is great truth to that. Um, so it's not how we end our season, but it is how we're ending tonight's announcement. <laughs> our, our, our not last show is Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods. <laughs> That's it for 2023. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you here next year.